Hello, hello. Happy Wednesday. How's everybody doing? Why is this blurry? Come on. It's not like I ran off. My face is right here. Hi Dylan, hi Base Hunter. How are you doing? Well, that's not what I meant to do. Yeah, I know. Like... Is that better? Well, there you go. It was ho foggy. There you go. How's that? Yes, this is... I, I wanted to... So... Here's the frustrating thing, right? Um... Uh... Rip... Roll. <laughs> <clears throat> here's here's the other shirt that I want to get because it's a similar mm. Ooh. yeah I really want to grab this shirt as well. Because they have the same general style. Oh yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, if you convert the twenty-five dollars, I I I I guessed as much, Dylan. Um, this one twenty-five US plus shipping. Converted to Australian ends up like $70, and I'm not willing to drop $70 on a shirt. Not, not at the moment. Uh, okay, so I have a thing. Mm-hmm. So, let's bump this down to 150%. So this is my um, UEFI boot. And you'll notice I have two entries that are dynamically added if you're running in Hyper-V. Um, and then my standard one, and then a standard with a 5.3 kernel. I can actually update these three to 5.3 now, because these were previously running... Um, let's see. Yeah, so this was previously running 5.0 and is now running 5.3 and 5.3 functions the challenge I'm running into now now that I've got 5.3 working because I originally couldn't get 5.3 working I only got 5.3 working once I updated Ubuntu from 1904 to 1904 1910 and yeah that's a lot of money so yeah I updated to 1910 and then that allowed me to build a working 5.3 kernel the problem I run into is that by default for some reason the 5 and 5.3 kernels don't come with proper real tech and um, real tech and the Wi-Fi adapter in the Surface Book 2. So what I've actually done here is for this one I actually have a command here IP where I'm setting the network uh, the Wi-Fi adapter on but it doesn't work properly because the network adapter isn't found at all during the boot process. So what I'm going to do is, we're going to quickly discard this. Say we're booting into... Oh yeah. 
That's exciting. So here's what I'm going to do. I know that this 5-3 kernel works in, um, in Hyper-V. To get it working in Hyper-V, I actually had to add a bunch of drivers. So what I'm first going to do is I'm going to show you edit. What we're going to do is instead of just booting straight in, I also debated streaming at 1440p. So we're going to do break equals free mount, and then control X to boot. So what this will do, is it'll load into the initial RAM disk, or initRD. Or actually, it's really init... init RAMFS now. It's all really the same. Now you'll notice that took a fair bit to load. My, my init RD at this stage is a whole 98 meg. And what you'll notice is while, so essentially what happens is we go into, um, from, to, to boot securely into Grub, you actually go um, shim, Grub, then RAM disk, then the actual operating system. So right now we're in the RAM disk and we're actually in the um, pre-mount stage. So at this stage, it hasn't actually gone, okay, here is your uh, storage hardware, and we're going to mount all of that. And what you'll notice is over here, I actually have the Hyper-V utility driver, um, a VM bus HID compliant mouse, and a bunch of other stuff, and Hyper-V keyboard. I had to install those drivers manually into the init RAM file system. But the other critical thing here is if I hit IPA, this will give me the list of network adapters available to me within the RAM disk. This is before I hit the operating system. And the network adapters available at this stage will be used to mount um, the NFS storage that I have on my other machine so that it can then boot into the operating system. The problem is that my Surface Book has no network adapters at this stage. Now, there's two parts to this. The first part is, by default, the Realtek drivers are not included. And the second part is Wi-Fi drivers usually aren't required at this stage. And thirdly, if you do have Wi-Fi drivers at this stage, then obviously you have to pre-configure everything for it to log in. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to now that you've seen all of the stuff that happens here, we're going to continue the boot. It's going to mount the file system, load into the OS, and we can reset this zoom level to auto. And we're going to boot into 19M. So there are a few things I'm going to mess around with today. The first is the colleague who originally taught me most of this stuff actually uploaded his grub config to GitHub. I am scrolling through the messages we exchanged. <laughs> Let me log in here. Oh. So this is available for everyone now, PXE boot files for Grub. Now when I originally set my um, Hyper-V stuff up, or actually my UEFI stuff, originally it was all, all BIOS, no Grub, uh, no, no UEFI. And that was because that's all my colleague knew how to do. And so this is the VM that supports booting by BIOS. And this is the screen that you would see. You'll notice, <clears throat> because I'm using SysLinux here, or PXE Linux, there's no boot menu, it just goes straight into it 
certain fruits. And this is... Uh, is it still bad? Okay. Now here's the weird thing. So firstly, I have a few goals here. First, I want to get the grub menu available on both. Which this will allow me to do. The second thing is there's a weird behavior that I'm having at the moment with light DM. And I bet GDM will do the same thing. Is after it's reached the point where it can show a UI. And this is what was happening on the laptop the other stream that I did for OBS where I was trying to get Ubuntu booted on a few laptops and half of them weren't working. This is why. Because normally on this screen you can actually see the blinking cursor. So this is TTY2. If I go to TTI, uh, TTY1, now it has that and then disappears because it's trying to load the actual UI. And it was failing. And now it's kind of sort of there. It's got a cursor but that's about it. There we go, it actually showed a screen this time. So I want to make that a little more reliable, and I'm not sure how I'm going to do that yet. But that at least shows you that it's capable of working both in BIOS mode and in UEFI mode. Now when you have UEFI mode, you also need to support secure boot with stuff like my Surface Book. Which is a whole other thing, and that's why the shim exists. Oh, I, I see Dylan's jumped into streaming. I'm, I'm going to jump in there. So that's why the shim exists. Now we're here. Now, from here, you'll notice that the cursor is a bit laggy, and obviously I can't resize the, the screen, the resolution, and if I go into display settings... I'm sure they'll respond, Dylan. It's the middle of the night for most of the world. Um... So the resolution by default in Hyper-V, well, I say Hyper-V, I don't know if it's a mix of Hyper-V or, or Ubuntu, no worries. This gives me a really wonky resolution. So those Hyper-V entries that you saw in, um, in Grub, they are from... Well, they are designed to configure the Hyper-V frame buffer at different resolutions. There are two downsides to that. The first is that the Hyper-V frame buffer is slow. It's just the way it was designed, it has a maximum of 8 megabytes of, of memory. I'm going to connect my... Uh, connect into... The host, the server, we're going to go into TFT boot, we're going to go into grub, and we're going to nano the grub config. So here's the grub config. Yep. And quite simply, we in here go... Video equals Hyper-V frame buffer 1920 by 1080, which is just a nice 1080p thing. And also 1680 by 1050, because that is the resolution of my top monitor. So if I want to run it full screen on there, that is my, my best option. And both of these are currently configured for the 5.0 uh, RAM disk and kernel. And what I've actually done is anything Hyper-V, it actually determines that based on the MAC address. If the MAC address starts with these letters and numbers, then it goes, that's Hyper-V, I'll only show it for Hyper-V. But for all other machines, it'll show native. It'll show native with a 5.3 kernel, because this one's still 5.0 as well. And then the Surface Book 2 one, which is the one I'm in the process of trying to configure. So that's with wireless one on. And what we can actually do in here is there's a file in the etc folder. Nano modules. 
this is a list of modules that you want to include. And they'll be loaded at boot time. In this case, what I've done is I've added the actual required one for the Ethernet adapter built into the Surface Dock. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. How are you? I'm doing all right. How have you been, man? Busy, tired, all of the above. <laughs> how's been work? How's working from home been? Uh, it it's been all right. I feel a little less productive this week just because everyone else has started working from home as well, which means the network connection to the office is a bit slow. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm hoping to kind of improve that over the next couple of days, just adjust how I grab stuff from the office and what I keep locally and all of that. Right. Yeah. That's the real tech stuff. This isn't working. Um, it's supposed to. But as far as I can tell, it does get copied in. It just doesn't get loaded. Um, and that could be because I'm loading all these other real tech drivers or modules as well. Or some other reason. And then I get the Marvell uh, Surface Wi-Fi drivers in as well. And I know that because I specifically have a Ubuntu 19.10 um, live USB, which does successfully give me the network adapters in the RAM disk. I know it's possible. <laughs> um, and then I actually booted into Ubuntu from the live USB and it came with working drivers. So I was able to load up a couple commands that told me, hey, this is the exact module that you need. And then that's also part of Wi-Fi. These two, I've disabled this one for now because I don't actually have the drivers for it, just the modules. And then all the Hyper-V stuff. Now, of course, all the Hyper-V stuff, originally it just yelled at me because there was no... Um, yes, exactly, walking dude. I think that's, that's part of it. Um, so initially I was like, okay, I know 5.3 by default when I build it does not include Hyper-V stuff. So I literally googled Hyper-V modules and added them, and they all worked first time once I built my own RAM disk and booted into it. These guys, however, not, not working. Um, and then the other issue I ran into was I prepared myself to be able to screen share my Surface Book with you guys, but neither the UEFI screens or the Grub boot menu show on external displays, only on the Surface display. <laughs> Oh. So there's no way for me to actually show this nicely. So you can't, like, properly dock your Surface Book? I, I can no. dock it. Um, and all of... If I'm in Windows, everything works. Like, I can specifically close the Surface. It'll turn off that display and then use the real displays. But during that boot process, it will exclusively use the Surface display. No matter what. No matter what, whether the screen's closed, I don't... The only thing that I could think of is if I somehow disabled the display hardware somehow, maybe it would work. But I'm not willing to risk potentially screwing myself over, where I disable the internal display and it still doesn't show anywhere. Yeah, because then you're like, well... Mm -hmm. How do you... I mean, you could connect it to an external display and then once it completes the boot process, but how do you know it's going to successfully boot, complete the boot process? Necessarily, if it doesn't detect its own display. Exactly. And then it's like, it's, there's too many risks involved. Yes, and because it's a very expensive laptop, I'm not willing to do that. Has working from home given you more or less time to do things? Um, more because I'm no longer spending two hours a day commuting, but at the same time, because I'm in the same spot all day, it's very hard to differentiate between work time and, um, non-work time other than looking at the clock. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I was really glad that, um, when I got, when I'm in my, when my family moved is that I don't have my computer in my bedroom. <laughs> yeah. Um, walking dude, I can control the BIOS, or I, it's, it's UEFI, um, with the keyboard. Um, it is prioritized to work with touch. But like, even the Windows recovery screens, they also only show on the laptop display. My guess is those other displays just aren't initialized, 
until... Like, even the boot logo doesn't show. It's only once you're in the operating system where it goes, huh. There's another so, display here. Yeah. So, this is where it gets really challenging. I booted this into the 5.3 kernel, so we're actually going to boot into the 5.0 kernel. That doesn't sound like a good plan. So that I can rebuild the 5.3 kernel while still running the 5.0 kernel. So that every time I rebuild it, I can just... Um, mm. Yeah. What I... Um, your state doesn't have any... What are your state's restrictions currently on movement? Um, not a lot on movement. I think the, the country has now reached a point where it's maximum 10 people gatherings. I just wanted to know if you can, like, do, like, walks around a block or anything. Yeah, as, as far as I know. Because I was thinking <clears throat> that a good way to differentiate between the start and an end of a work day is to literally go for a short walk before you start and then go for a short walk when you're done. Yeah. Because that is generally considered a very good way to like provide a separation between no why well, i'm 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 starting work now because i've done my air quotes commute and then you have when you're like no i am done for the day it is time for leisure and personal stuff i've already done my walk to say i'm done with work now true that that's definitely a a way to do it it's funny though because i am using three of uh, our displays um my dad, who is also now working from home, did not have a spare display to work with, so I just gave him my TV. <laughs> You're used to, are you used to four? No. Uh, I use three 1080p screens at, um, at work. I have these three set up here, and I had the TV set up with an Xbox, but I let a friend borrow the Xbox, so I haven't really used the TV in the past two months, right. I'd say. Have they given the Xbox back? Um, no. Um, Might want to get that quickly. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to play some... Sea of Thieves with them, which is why I gave them the Xbox. Right, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be PC surprised people are doing fine. that, Walking Dude. Hmm? Because you can just play it on PC just fine. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes it's a surprise, um, um, just like the kind of, um, sometimes it can be a surprise, um, how bad some people's computers are given what they do. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I would generally, not all completely, but generally expect most programmers to have at least semi-decent computers at home. But um, I was doing, I was helping out uh, uh, someone with OBS streaming today, who's a member of um, a band I really like. But what they, but their day job is uh, is a programmer, and uh, their uh, <clears throat> PC that they're trying to stream on Windows Windows Seven, which is yeah, but mm -hmm. it was a second generation i five, so a two thousand i5 um oh no you, so you, okay you remember when you when i linked that um log to analyze and then you did the sweat and animated emote and like mm -hmm. midday for you mm -hmm. yeah that one that <laughs> one <laughs> can can i can i pull that up just to show people on screen how ridiculous that is also, they try. They set the X two six four to slower. <laughs> oh God. Um. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> oh, this one doesn't even show. Okay. <clears throat> doesn't show the potential bottlenecks. 
of the CPU and uh, GPU. That's mm. uh, Rodney's bot does that. Yep. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> you could let just me, take a me, screenshot of it. Yeah. Let me grab a screenshot. Were you yeah. using snipping tool? Um, I was going to, and then realized actually it's easier if I just use ShareX. Use ShareX, yeah. <clears throat> Core i5 possible bottleneck. Radeon R7 Plus HD possible bottleneck. I'm actually surprised it didn't show up as potato. 30, 32 bit on 64 bit. And running, mm -hmm. and the person had set the um, CPU preset to slower, and they're wondering why they only had like one frame every three seconds, and no one could keep the stream open. One 1080p 60 hertz display. A display capture and two images. Yeah, I told them they should probably use game capture. And then that bitrate too for 1080p. <laughs> the, no, here's the thing. I told them to downscale that. Um, they're running... Their internet is only 3,000 megabits per... Sorry, 3,000 kilobits per second. Upload. Mm. And that's not just a Twitch. That's ideal. <laughs> I, oh, I dropped 200 them, Yeah, frames. you probably only want like 2,000 to 2,500 at best is what I told them. Yeah, which you don't want to do 1080p60 for that. I told them to drop to 720p30 at most. They didn't do the 30 one. Yeah. Oh, did I buffer for a whole 30 seconds? Not mm. for me. Okay. Then again, I'm in New Zealand. I'm just like a short hop. Walking it, dude it, isn't, it, as far it, as I know. It, 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 it's funny because network of hops is a term used in networking. Mm. But hops is also referred to the distance between our two countries. It's a really funny joke. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, I'm i confused. When I load Grub... Uh, Walking Dude, you might know the answer to this. When I load Grub on my surface, it's... It's loading at the full 3000 by 2000, which means it's... Um, <laughs> yes, hopefully. which means it's super tiny. Oh, I know why. Because of that guy. Right. Annoyingly, I can't show this. What can't you show? Oh, yeah, no, it's still running at that full res. Um, okay. So, essentially, <laughs> the grub boot menu and the RAM disk run at 3000 by 2000 without any um, font scaling. Right. So a question, that, that that one that's currently in the virtual machine connection, is that a virtual boot or is that... Is that a VM or is that on your other computer? So this is a VM running on this machine, the high performance Ryzen. With the whole operating system from. being okay. co copied over, yes. It was just robot voice there for me. Like, I don't know about stream. Oh, weird, really? Just for a moment there, there was robot voice. Was it when I opened Task Manager? Maybe. Um, yes, Walking Dude, we did. F well, so you figured out a way to set fonts larger. I don't think we figured out a way to do it programmatically based on the resolution. And the other weird thing is that I did set this to a 1920 by 1080 graphics mode. So my assumption was that it would correctly... Um... You know, correctly size itself. You fool. Mm, apparently. Well, scale the font at least, or at least set its visuals to a maximum of 1080p rather than 3000 by 2000. The I'm other thing is... that on a, on a uh, 3840 by 2160 <laughs> screen. Yeah. The, the other question I have um, is I set up to pull from that uh, that example, which contains... 
themes. And then I tried to grab from this theme. Gingella? Yeah. But for some reason, it yells at me. <laughs> well, the boot server isn't working in the office, by the way. I don't know what happened. Um, so if I do this, set theme the exact same way it is in the example, which is this guy, which just goes theme equals, even though it's in a subdirectory called themes, uh -huh. that gives me a file not found. So question, the graphics mode for setting the resolution, is that only for the bootloader or is that for... That's specific to Grub. So why do you set it to 1080? If you want the bigger font, why don't you just set it to, like, 10, like a square resolution of some kind or a small Because e even at 1080, it's not changing the font from the 3000 by 2000. That's the weird thing. Because I, in my experience, bootloaders, generally speaking, have not exactly looked like they're running at 1080p for me ever. Uh, yes, because they don't have the graphics drivers. Whereas this grub is set up with the right drivers. Yeah. Um, so if we uh, KLF bar log. Oh, look, message isn't a thing. Yeah. Um, plain PXC information rocket. Yeah. Annoyingly, <laughs> so many things don't support secure boot. Yeah, in this case, we're using grub and assigned shim. Uh, I mean, in my experience, the only thing that has supported secure boot is Windows. And that's what the shim is for. Um, the other thing I've set up here is I do have a Samba share, but the TFT boot folder, I don't have access to read, Samba so hold on. Samba share is SMB, right? Yes. Is Samba just like the Linux SMB server? Or is that how you're supposed to call SMB and I've just been calling it wrong? Uh, Samba is the actual name of the server itself. I don't know if... I think Samba's just the name of the actual server that runs on Linux. I don't think it's the actual name of the protocol. Well, the protocol is SMB. Yeah, Because it's message server block. message block. So IPXC doesn't officially support Secure Boot or UEFI, but you can download a UEFI capable IPXC. VirtualBox just doesn't come with one that's that got it enabled. It's all a mess, really. I'm going to be dealing. Well, seeing as I'm going to be in lockdown for four weeks, I might as well try and... And I've got that AMD GPU that Jim sent. I might as well start trying to KVM my PC. Sounds like fun. So yes, I just tried yeah. booting into the 5.3 kernel on my Surface, and it's still not correctly... Um, that would booting. be... My KVM setup would be AMD, that AMD GPU would be running a Linux host, and then Windows would be a guest running the NVIDIA. I'm wondering if, I'm wondering if it's worth, try, if, I don't know if I'd actually do this for real, but I'm wanting to see how streaming from an, a Linux host with a Windows guest would look. I wouldn't want to do it because AMD would being on the Linux side and streaming from there would mean I won't have an NVENC. 
Mm -hmm. But I want to see how that experience is like. Well, I so you can that... have NVENC as long as you build FFmpeg with NVENC support. No, I'm saying if if I have a KVM where Linux is the oh, host true. machine yeah, yeah, yeah. using the AMD GPU and the Windows guest is using the NVIDIA, I can't stream with NVENC from the Linux host. Hmm. So what I'm saying, what I'm, what I'm saying is I probably wouldn't actually do that for like real streaming, but I'm curious how that experience is like because I know that there is a plugin for OBS which lets you take the video from Looking Glass, which is a program that runs on the on a Windows guest and a Linux host to be able to effectively just it does uh it copies the video buffer from vram into ram so it can show on the linux host yeah hey crash welcome thanks for the follow welcome to the order how are you doing and actually why are you awake at this hour <laughs> what crazy things are you cooking up today I, okay i hate how kvm has two meanings yep it can be Keyboard, video, mouse, or it can mean kernel virtualization, virtualized machine. Yeah. Because I was about to say the, that looking glass is an alternative to running a KVM with a KVM. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's awesome. Welcome. Um, so, uh, walking dude, as you can see, I just checked the insides of my RAM disk, and it does contain... The Realtek uh, driver and the MWiFi X drivers for the Wi-Fi adapter. So I don't know why it's not working. It's really weird. And actually, let me quickly check your... Zero, 18. No. Not for those two anyway. Now here's... Let me quickly pull up what yours had. Because that's the one we built in the office, and then I downloaded. Yeah, it has the exact same stuff. Um... Alright. Here's what I'm gonna do. I am going to quickly modify my grub... Uh... my grub config and we're gonna quickly add yours in I forget crash is the obsessive nerds guy on Twitter yes am I thinking of the right one yes. I, think so. I have a bad memory for names one of the two yes I have a very bad memory for names like <laughs> had to check Yeah, I got to to meet a few people at uh, TwitchCon, including Crash, which was fun. Someone else was lucky enough to do the NVIDIA demo to him, though. <laughs> <laughs> Could very well have been me, and I just didn't realize. <laughs> 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 I mean, Crash is welcome to jump on Twitch instead. I just stream to but both. But he's also welcome to stay on Mixer. Yeah. So what I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to rename this one. Oh, really? Oh, no. That was a mistake. I, I at least got to show you okay. the video behind me of how it looked. So, uh, minor request... That um, console you have in the bottom left, can you move it down slightly so I can actually read the chat? <laughs> there you go. 
There you go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> much, much appreciated. I can go one better. <laughs> yes, much, much appreciated. So yeah, I'm going to quickly... Oh, I don't even know if my uh, camera has a long enough. All right. I'm going to do this super hacky because I can. Um, hacky solutions are the best solutions. 2501. <laughs> I still don't know why you keep so many OBS builds around. Exactly for this purpose, because I haven't rebuilt my OBS with 25 yet. Ah. Yeah, but... You're, why They're do you capitalized. Need, why do you need version 19? <laughs> um, because you'd be surprised who, um, what kind of things, people, what issues people run into. Um, I've never had to, I've never run into someone's issue where I've been like, okay, let me check with OBS 19. <laughs> oh, I see what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're doing. Hell yeah, I am. Now, now I can't remember the name of the app I installed that gives me SRT. So... Oh, 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 I, I should have... Yes, it is. Larix Broadcaster. Oh, yeah. I saw some people mentioning that in uh, uh, video dev. Mm-hmm. There we go. So now I should be able to just... Don't worry. Your, your stream is obscure enough that I can call there it. There we go. It. <laughs> your stream is obscure enough that I can mention video dev and it not being an issue. <laughs> uh, actually, I can do it from here now. Sorry, that was that, that. I just realized that could actually have been a low-grade insult. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care. Your, stream, your stream's so obscure, I could get away with calling, oh, that's naming weird. things. <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay. So. Oh, dude. Shouldn't matter. Um. You look prepared to. You look um. Fully prepared to go into the support channels of OBS really? and ask what happened to all of your docs. There shouldn't have been Echo. That's weird. Thanks for the follow crash. Alright, so here's here's how bad this works, yeah? Yeah, your, your, your current OBS setup there is the quintessential... Um, I don't know what happened to my OBS UI help, um, support request. Uh, there's, there's the file not found error. And then, here's, here's the boot menu. Ouch, that's bad. I can deal with, like, incredibly small fonts that would make me feel a bit <laughs> oops <laughs> i renamed both the kernel and the other one didn't i well that was a mistake <laughs> i like how with that camera you could see that you have all the support channels muted <laughs> Shh. um Face Funny Hunter, enough, that's I the other OBS. That one doesn't have monitoring enabled or anything, so there's no way you should have been able to hear it. Unless I set the output to... Oh, no. <laughs> um, okay, so I accidentally modified both of these guys. This one, uh, I think, is generic. Let me double-check that I actually have that. See, I haven't actually muted the support channels. I just don't look at them most of the time. 500... Uh, I don't own a... Oh, it's a five three zero eighteen. Okay. Did you did you put a number in wrong? Yes. Um. Uh, pretty much. Um. Yeah. We. <laughs> when we initially were messing with this in the office, we literally used a phone camera and took photos to be able to see the text. <laughs> 
Oh, that's great. Because, I mean, let's be honest, you don't want to be reading that. Who needs like, eyesight? Th this is the comfortable seating distance. Like, that is not... <laughs> not Yikes. good. Yikes. What's that on the left? Uh, photo from my first US trip. Um, okay, uh, so now that that... Uh, let's... <laughs> let's reboot and actually boot into an existing... Um, Colonel. So this will be the one, and actually, I'll go one further. See ya, Crash. See ya, Crash. Thanks for stopping by. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to break this one at pre-mount as well to see what it actually contains. Don't break things. So the break command in, um... In... The Ram like disk. breakpoint? It's basically a breakpoint, and there are multiple multiple stages where you can breakpoint. In this case, I'm doing it before mount, but you can do it before loading modules. You can do it after the network adapter has been um, grabbed. Or once an IP address has been assigned to see whether everything's working before you actually go into the final stages of boot. Well, that's how we go. Let's see how we go. If it's actually gonna even... Have you, um... Do you still have that Mac it booted into Windows. Um, I have, have a Mac, Mac VM. I do not have the Mac that I had at the other company. Ah. Uh. Oh, have you changed jobs? Yeah, I went back. Went back? Yeah. I thought you were that company went went bankrupt. Uh kind of, and it then got bought out. Hi Elf right. Lover. Long time no see. How you okay. doing? So here's the here's the really weird behavior, right? None of this shows up in external uh drives, uh, external screens when I try and do this, which is frustrating. We get to see more of your room. <laughs> oh yeah, the 10 year old posters behind me. All right, so this doesn't even show up in uh, external displays. My hand is shaking. Is the... Wait, is the BIOS for a Surface Book look like Windows? No, so if you hold Shift and click Restart from within Windows... Oh, it's, it, it lets you use the Windows bootloader, but it gives you all those different options. Yes, um, but only in UEFI mode do you get access to, um, uh, to stuff like Network Boot. If your machine has BIOS, it'll boot into a, into that screen, but not give you any control as to what you actually boot into. Um, walking dude, I tried the dock. I tried a USB-C to HDMI adapter. Alright, let's see how this goes. Does the Surface Book have a traditional BIOS boot screen? A BIOS screen? It, it has menu? a... I wouldn't say traditional. It looks more like a web interface, to be honest. A web interface for BIOS? Well, it's UEFI. So they Fair have enough. a lot more control over styling. And because they know the exact resolution of the display. Okay, so now we're booted into this. To me, in my mind, BIOS screens are still just blue with grey boxes. <laughs> Okay, so Walking Dude, your InitRD does have working network drivers. For both Wi-Fi and for Ethernet. So what am I doing differently? <laughs> um, you did actually give the specific firmware things. Yeah, how did you actually put those in, Walking Dude? I'm copying the text now.
So that, those are the Ethernet drivers. I still need the Wi-Fi drivers. Oh god. Um, fine. Um... Anyway, I was just gonna stick around for a little little bit and I only really joined in case you did, so. But I'm gonna be heading out to another friend's stream. It should be starting soon. No worries. Thanks for stopping by. See ya, man. See ya. Hi, Andersama. Um, welcome, dude. You're welcome to jump into, uh, into the Discord channel if you want to, if you don't want to have to type all of this out. What's weird is it doesn't complain about possible missing firmware. Um, and actually, now that you sent me those file names, let me quickly try... I feel like... Walking Dude, I feel like you had a script that specifically... Either copied or repackaged them. Yeah, yours definitely contains the firmware. And mine does not. That'd that'd do it. Um, okay, so that's the Ethernet real tech stuff. What about the What about the firmware? What else is in? I'm gonna quickly let my cat out of the room. Uh, so, Andersama, this this VM here is actually a PXE boot. Nothing on here is locally in the VM. I can actually show you settings. There is no hard drive here. I only gave it four virtual processors? What was I thinking? But yeah, that one has no, no hard drive. Alright, so in that case, there has to be a script that we did. Yeah, I, I have a feeling we did a hook that copied it over. So in this case, I'm trying to uh, boot on my Surface Book 2. And actually, what this taught me... is that it can't focus for crap. Come on, camera. <laughs> um, is that a file system I could access if I had access to the office, walking dude?
literally the autofocus is broken. Anyway, I know that I need to... Yeah, not in this app, because I'm using a media streaming app. We also specifically named the adapter MLAN1, but I don't remember if... Uh, I don't remember how we did that. Yes, I believe it is down too, because I tried connecting to it earlier and it didn't work. Oh, actually... Um... I'm gonna try anyway. Because there were a couple servers down this morning when I tested that came back up later. Don't mind me. <laughs> Although... be able to look at the hooks in the actual running thing, could I? Um, alright, let's load up manager. Let's find out if it's actually running. No, nah, bird image was not found. Bummer! Well, at least we know it's a hook that we need. Um, I just disconnected, come on! Yep, that found a boot image. So that's a good sign. Yep, there's Enigma. <laughs> Alright. At least we know it works. Oh. Turn off. I keep forgetting that turn off versus shut down mean very different things in Hyper-V. Um, Oh, neat. Uh, so, Andasama, the general idea... The general idea is everything for the operating system is stored on a server. Then any computer on the network can literally boot into that operating system and use the local resources. So, for example, I can boot it in a VM and have access to the VM's CPU, GPU, and so on. Uh, hi DJ, welcome to the uh, order. Thanks for the follow. Or I can boot it on my proper computer with three displays, a 1080 Ti, and so on. Or I can boot it on my brother's uh, i7 with a with a GTX 1050. And that allows me to test different configurations for, say, something like OBS without having to actually be on a non-persistent live USB. Uh, so yes, Walking Dude, it does work. Um, not just a VM. 
in this case, a VM, yes. But I'm actually trying to get my laptop to work. To do that, I need the firmware for the Ethernet and the Wi-Fi adapter. And once I've got that, I'll be able to network boot it. And my goal is actually to be able to do it on Wi-Fi exclusively because the initial PXE search has to occur on real hardware. But once that search is done, once I hit Grub, or really once I hit the RAM disk, if I can do that on Wi-Fi, then I can boot into Ubuntu on Wi-Fi and I can walk around with a laptop running Ubuntu without it actually being installed, but with the benefit of persistent storage and shared files everywhere. So in this case, here's Git ahead. And this is basically all pre-configured. So say we look at this, right? Oh, actually, no, better yet. Uh, No, what, what's my folder? OBS build. OBS, here we go. For this. This is five commits behind. And this is in um, Hyper-V, right? Now let's grab VirtualBox. And UEFI doesn't work. Ah, perfect. I'm going to pop this on my second screen just in case. Um, I'm actually going to close this. Aha! Huh. So you have a couple extra lines in there compared to the example that we originally used, I see. Uh, my mouse just disappeared for a sec. Cool, so we're actually going to not boot this guy in UEFI. So this time we're booting VirtualBox. And I don't actually know if this is going to work, because it didn't work the last time I tried it. So this is using IPXE, and now this virtual box is booting off the network to the exact same operating system that's running in Hyper-V, with a different kernel, because it's the old kernel. Actually no, that'd be the same kernel as there. Cool, so... This will run at a weird resolution, but that's fine. The only thing I'm missing out on with all of this is in the case of VirtualBox, VirtualBox Guest Editions, and in the case of Hyper-V, um, Enhanced Session Mode. Oh, I really need to fix the, um, the network file. There we go, Ubuntu 1910. Oh yeah, because the host name's already in use. Remember when we ran into that issue <laughs> with the... Uh, with the conflicting IPs, Walking Dude, that was fun. Right? So now in this case, I'm running the exact same operating system with Hyper-V's virtual hardware and VirtualBox's virtual hardware. So for example, I could see the differences. And because it's all mounted over the network, any change I make happens...
<laughs> so audition crashed. The thing that allows me to have all these vocal effects. I'd like to know when it crashed. Um, so to answer your question, Information Rocket, yes, you can detect what you're booting from. You can detect even so far as the full MAC address of the device you're booting from and change Grub's behavior based on that. In this case, uh, not this one. In this case, going, hey, your MAC address is a Hyper-V MAC address. Use the Hyper-V frame buffer so that you can set a custom resolution up to 1080p. So this guy's taking forever. I don't think I gave it enough resources. Okay. Doesn't matter. Now that we have the files that we need... Um, so that's marvel.sh, and actually... This is a hook, oh, right? Is it good now? According to OBS, my audio should be fine, but no one's responding. And I'm worried. Oh, there we go. Something's happening. Ah, yes. This is the issue I have on, on BIOS. Where LightDM just takes forever to launch for no reason. And GDM doesn't work on, like, half my hardware, so I can't do it. But yeah. Different hardware, same same OS is the general idea. So what are we doing here? We are grabbing prereq. Then we're processing this guy, and then we're copying... When do you determine Desta? Okay. Oh, you know what's going to suck here? Yes, it does have a bit of a staticky relaunch. I did notice that it clipped, which is not great. Um, so we're going to go firmware. Because I'm doing this in a Hyper-V VM, I can't actually copy and paste text because it's not an enhanced session, <laughs> which is great. Um, that was some rendering lag. Why is that rendering lag? So hopefully I don't get any of this wrong. I keep forgetting. I need to make sure. MLAN zero. Hmm. That's alright. We'll see if this Wi-Fi one works, at least. I do wonder if it's these ones that I'm missing as well. I notice yours also has an exit zero. Mine doesn't. But it doesn't yell at me, so I'm just gonna go... Oh no! The bastard. Luckily, I can trust Ubuntu's clipboard.
Uh, no. Still in nano modules. Yeah, I don't think he did either. But then again, you tried a lot of things without me, so... Okay, let's repack and see what happens. Uh, that guy. You can see I've run this command a few times. Oh, that's nice. It... Semi-generic. It's still technically branded based on the hypervisor you're using. Yeah. It's pretty neat. And it's not even a VM. I mean, in this case, it's a VM, but it doesn't have to be. So, if I remember correctly, none of these... None of these are currently booted into the kernel I just built. So I should be able to just... or not the kernel, the RAM disk I just built. I keep doing that. I keep getting these two folders mixed up. So in this case, we're going from a 95 megabyte uh, RAM disk. Oh no. Oh no, I've already got that one. I've already got the scripts because I found them. Um, and that one I assume... Yeah. I, I found a guide. I, probably the guide you followed that had basically near identical commands. The scripts I've got, it's the hook that I was missing. Um, or the, the hook that specifically copied the files I needed. Um, cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to copy from the NFS mount, diskless, etc. No. Boot. In it. 5326 generic to here. So the file I just built here, or the one I generated in the Ubuntu VM, lives in, or the entire OS lives in NFS root diskless on the host machine. So this here is a laptop. It has the host name L502, and the VM itself has a host name L502X which allows me to differentiate, but I might actually rename the L502X to something like um, wizardcm-pxe. I've been meaning to, but I remember there being like three places where you have to rename it, and I don't remember what those three places are. Well, it's purely a way for me to build on Ubuntu and test it. Let's see how we go. I'm hoping for the best here. <laughs> I booted the wrong one! <laughs> you mean this one? Crap, I booted the wrong one. They're all so similar. And I only have to do that in... in the VM's files, right? 
nothing in the PXE host. Now here's where we find out that I got the network adapter name wrong. <laughs> yes it is! Oh actually, how much bigger is the RAM disk now? It's 106 meg. We added 11 megabytes. We have a network adapter! We have Wi-Fi! Now, here's the problem. I, um... My grub bootloader has the wrong... My grub config has the wrong network adapter name. Uh, apparently I was modifying it elsewhere. Yeah. Because it's still called... What is it still called? Uh, actually, no. That is the correct... Okay. It's correct here. But is it correct... Ah, uh, no, actually. One sec. Well, I was just checking my Wi-Fi. Um, not yet. So, that was pre-mount. Um, my concern is... No, actually, it's correct everywhere. So here's the moment of truth. Um, so I... I mounted the RAM disk... over Ethernet. But because we don't have Ethernet drivers at this stage, the only way it can mount the... actual stuff that we need... is over Wi-Fi. So let's see if this works. It's working! Yes, so, Andasama, the... Uh-oh. It can't connect to the server. So, here's the very fascinating thing about how this works. Um, when you're booting a machine... In the BIOS or the UEFI, you can choose a boot device, right? Say in this case I choose Network Boot. That'll launch a thing that's an, essentially a mini OS on the BIOS. Why would the NFS mount fail there? Because the Wi-Fi... Didn't we run into this? Walking dude? So the network mount that occurs at that stage is controlled entirely by the BIOS. And the BIOS goes, you have, in this, in the case of the Surface Book, you have one... Um, it goes, you have one signed network adapter. That's the way the, the Surface works. No, I don't know. It crashed on me. 
in Wi-Fi X command timeout function. Their server not responding. Does it have to be? Anyway, let me finish explaining this to Andasama because he's lost at the moment. Um, let me pull up. Let's go super basic here. So the BIOS gets an IP address. Using that IP address, it fetches the bootloader. So this, this loads on the local machine, the BIOS, and that gets an IP address, and then loads Grub. Well, actually, it's a little more complicated with... Um, with secure boot, because you also have a shim, which is signed by Microsoft, so that it can load grub. But let's call this one package. So that grub, grub itself doesn't need a network connection. It just has the config file it received, and it's using the network information from the BIOS. Then, using grub, you load a RAM disk. Now, there are two names for these guys. But it's the same thing. This RAM disk doesn't have any of the information that the BIOS passed on to Grub. It only has the information that Grub passed on, which in our example is, hey, you're booting over NFS, Here's your root file system. Here's your NFS root file system. It's readable and writable. Here's where you're getting your IP. And in this case, I'm telling it to break pre-mount so that I can check that the network adapters correctly exist. But with a normal uh, boot, say this one down here, all it's telling is um, go to this RAM disk with this kernel because we need the kernel, obviously. With this network boot, and use DHCP to give yourself an IP. So once the RAM disk loads, it needs to have the drivers and the firmware to get a network adapter. In the case of most hardware, that is included. With Realtek, and why, uh, so, the RAM disk loads only the basics that it needs. Hi, Curdle stuff. Long time no see. How you doing? Um, so the RAM disk loads the bare essentials. Display drivers, if, if available. Keyboard, mouse, um, network. Just the bare essentials. In the case of network, it only grabs Ethernet because that's what it expects and that will always give you an IP address. Because it's assuming that whatever network adapter you connected with here, you're going to be connecting with over here. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm able to work from home, so it's not too much of a... too much craziness for me. Now, in our case, the RAM disk successfully has Ethernet drivers for my desktop PC, but it did not have drivers and firmware for Hyper-V which is over here. So in our in our config I typoed that. What was it letter missing? I haven't left the house in a week. <laughs> so what I've done here is I've told it, hey, I know these don't come by default. Grab them anyway, because I need them. And that includes the network adapter which is under HV Utils, Hyper V Utils. Um, and I gave it Hyper V network firmware and drivers. And now the VM can boot from this stage onward. 
my laptop does not come with those by default. So we had to manually copy over the relevant... Uh, so using this config, we tell it these are the um, drivers that you need. In this case, this one's the important one. And then we manually copied over the firmware using... Oh god, I lost it already. Using this script. We make a folder, and then we copy it from the operating system into where it's going to be on the RAM disk. In this, in this case, this is the Wi-Fi firmware. So now that we have that Wi-Fi firmware, we need the RAM disk to connect to the network so that we can get to the next stage. So this bit's easy, this bit's easy, this middle bit can be a pain. Now by default, the 5 firmware, the, the version 5 kernel and the version 5 RAM disk contain most of the stuff I need. But in the case of the stuff that the Surface Book uses, the Realtek drivers by default in Ubuntu do not work in the RAM disk. I don't know why they don't, they just don't. So, to do that, we'll have to find the firmware files and copy them over manually. But we don't know where they are at the moment. Um, Walking Dude's probably given up because, in my opinion, I want to just get the Wi-Fi stuff working. So, the general assumption is that you are using one network connection from one end to the other. What we're actually going to do is we're going to use one to this stage. Uh, no. And then a different network connection from here to here. In this case, Wi-Fi. Because what actually happens here is the RAM disk goes over the network and goes, give me my mount point and give me the files I need to boot into Ubuntu. And once it has that, Ubuntu takes over and it does its own network stuff. So really, you've got uh, let's go with purple here. No worries. No rush. This is one bucket. BIOS and GRUB have one set of network details. The RAM disk has its own network details. And then Ubuntu has its own stuff for user level stuff. We're in the process of configuring this guy. And then once we reach this point, it'll be a miracle and we'll be super excited. But the issue we're running into now is now that we have the Wi-Fi drivers loaded here. It goes to init bottom and then get stuck. Yes, so Ubuntu has the right drivers. And I know this because this is a live USB with Ubuntu 19.10. And those drivers definitely exist. It's getting to the Ubuntu stage that's, that's the problem because in this case, the Ubuntu we're loading into doesn't exist on the computer. It has to fetch it from the network. And that information of how to fetch it from the network is all defined in here. And which network to get it from is also all in here. So BIOS provides an IP address to grab Grub. Grub then loads a RAM disk. A RAM disk goes, I need a network connection to be able to load your files. And then Ubuntu loads and goes, I need a network connection for general internet stuff. Anyway, that's that's the general pick. Now the problem is we're getting stuck on init bottom.
uh, last scripts to be executed before procfs and sysfs are moved to the real root file system and execution is turned over to the init binary, which should be found in the mounted rootfs. Udev is stopped. So, what we're going to do now... Um, where would I run that? Pretty much, they have no relation, and a summer. Um, walking dude, is this for the Ethernet or for the Wi-Fi? Because for now, I just want to see if I can get Wi-Fi working. Oh. <laughs> I want to see if I can get Wi-Fi working first. Because it, it, it turns out Wi-Fi is easier. Um... So in this case, what we need... Is in this guy. RTL is Ethernet. Because that's real tech. Marvel is Wi-Fi. Oh! Oh! I know what's happening. No, I don't know what's happening. But the thing is, we did successfully get an IP. Yeah, it says NFS server not responding. Let's see what other people are suggesting. Should I get the NFS log and see what the NFS log gives me? Which NFS log do I want? Check this out. So there's an info, shut down M Wi-Fi X. Deleting the crypto keys. NFS server not responding, still trying. Now I do know that as part of the scripts that I grabbed... <laughs> I 
I do know that yes this guide specifically that like that string that I saw kill wireless So the system takes over later. I don't have that script at the moment. I wonder if I need it. Ah, oh, local bottom. Oh, I do have it. Okay. So it never reaches that point anyway. Well, here's what we're going to try. We're going to reboot. I'm going to shut down this guy. Because we know we can get far enough where we get an IP address. Well, welcome back, Curdle Stuff. Let's see how this goes. So, Curdle Stuff, I have Ubuntu installed on a very old laptop. That very old laptop has a network share set up, which allows me to boot into Ubuntu from any machine, and have access to all the files as if they were on the local machine, and also all the hardware as if it was on the local machine. So what if I manually, so in this case, I'm trying to boot on a Surface Book 2, but the old laptop is a Dell L502X. Um, IP link. Trying to see if I can. Yes, it is. Ah. <laughs> um, this is using a new piece of technology called SRT. And what I've actually done is I'm running this instance, the second instance of OBS, as um, essentially an SRT server in listener mode. And in the case of the mobile app, it is called Larix Broadcaster. Oh, the connection just died. There we go. Right, so. I brought the interface up. 
but it's not getting an IP. Because it doesn't have DHCP enabled? Um, so the only issue I'm running into Andasama is the 1 meg uh, buffer. That is the minimum limit in the media source, but I don't care. Uh, the other thing I need to check... Um, Walking Dude, you would know the answer to this. Currently, what I'm doing here is this is what it looks like. Would this use DHCP? So IP equals, I think it's five columns. Five columns, and then the network adapter, and then on. Because that's the... That's the recommendation from here. So really what I should be doing... No worries, Curdle Stuff, thanks for stopping by. Oh, hi, Sonic. No worries, lurking is appreciated. Ooh, I, I love cookies. I haven't had one in a while. Yeah, so the default for this is any. On or any? Use any protocol. Okay, so is the on that I'm using... So what if I change that on to a... To DHCP? Um, we're actually going to check see how it boots this time. Alright, it's on IP166. I actually wonder if the driver's crashing. Oh, it should have. Uh, up on the same. Is an arm okay? Uh, is this a CMD thing or a Ubuntu thing? do it from the server. Uh, I think the driver might actually be crashing, by the way. Because this one in particular goes NFS server not found and then it literally gives me a firmware dump. Ah, up minus A. So I bet it it died. So I might have to do that faster on the next boot. Uh, on Windows. Just 
crashed again. Now 166 is missing. The device is no longer up. It died. So let me reboot. Get to that stage again. And then I'll run it up. From both this guy. And Windows. Also rip. <laughs> Oh, actually, before I do that... <laughs> Base Hunter, I wish you luck. Um, what I'm gonna quickly do... Oh, I've got it loaded here, don't I? This guy. We're gonna change you to be DHCP. Instead of on. Um. The other thing I'm going to do is once I've got that hardware address, I'm going to update my grub menu so that the first option is the Surface Book option. So I don't have to manually go down three options. Yes, I do have it. But only on... Only on the Ubuntu host. Windows doesn't see it. Hi DJ. Yeah, no, lurking is fine. Lurking is appreciated. See the... I feel like... This is identical... Or near identical to the conflicting IPs issue. But it's not. Ah! Alright. Either way... That's not what I copied. Not what I copied at all. But 
So what I'm doing now is I'm modifying my group bootloader. <laughs> so that instead of manually going down to here every time, <laughs> oh man. You know what I might do? I'm going to boot Parzival on there to see if I get the same issue. To see if it's something we both did, or if it's something explicitly that I did wrong. And do I have yours set to break premount as well? Because I might remove that to see if that changes the behavior. I mean, it shouldn't. But you never really know. The other dumb thing is that I just realized that the Ethernet adapter is different to the Wi-Fi adapter, and so this regular expression is wrong. Well, let's find out, shall we? So that's a negative, but a different error.
<laughs> no worries. If it was a refollow, then my alert provider might be going, forget it. So are we missing a step when configuring the network adapter? In that case, we need to be modifying the scripts we're working with, right? Uh... Oh, there it is. Thanks for the follow. Hmm. But keep in mind, your whatever you do will be different to what I do because I'm doing it over Wi-Fi too. Whereas you're probably just going to go Ethernet. Right? I wonder if it's the missing files. <clears throat> okay, now it's not showing up at all. Well, to be fair, it does the same thing with Ethernet. The difference is Ethernet fails at pre-mount. Whereas Wi-Fi fails around the same stage with a different error. It fails on NFS bottom. I'm confused why this regular expression failed. I am all for dangerous distractions. I've been thinking about this all day. Um, is there a way for me to get verbose logs on this? Link set dev. How 
How come when I set... Yes, that's what I'm trying to do now. So I'm in break pre-mount. And I just brought the link up. But it's not getting an IP. It hasn't actually tried yet. So I literally just did IP link set dev wireless adapter name up. DHCPD is not a valid command. Doesn't exist. You want a DH client. Just sitting there now. What would be the method of doing that? Just next to the router and take a look. I mean, mine does both. Mine apparently thinks the Roomba is actually connected at the moment, which would be surprising. F06E. No, not currently connected. No, it doesn't. My cat's probably outside at the moment. It's not currently connected. Like, it says multicast up, but it doesn't have an IP. Oh no! <laughs> That's not promising. Hmm. <laughs> it knew that it, uh... 
Your DHCP is probably configured to give you an IP address. The command V should work for both log messages. Okay, so here's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, that's a possibility. If I'm doing it manually, yes. So, if I'm doing it manually, it doesn't know where to get the IP from. So let me try and do that. Um, Ubuntu connect to Wi-Fi from terminal. There's a command for this that I've used before. Oh. This link is purple. I'm going to guess it's this one. No. Oh, that's right, I need IW list. I don't have IW list. should be, but does it use that automatically? I mean, it was getting an IP in the automatic method. The manual one doesn't get, doesn't connect to a network. Let me quickly check something. Yeah. My supplicant is correct. Because it defaults to PSK. Which is what I'm using. How do I install IW list? IW config.
which I have. But does that occur before or after pre-mount? Yes, but I haven't triggered it manually. Did I? A uh, slight problem. If you run... If you run WPA CLI, it goes into interactive mode and you can't do anything. I'm rebooting. Nine thirty. I've been at this for two hours. Hmm, I thought we fixed this. Did we not fix this? Hmm. Yes, that's that's the page I had opened before. I copied everything from this over. I'm literally... The file you see open on the left here is A underscore enable wireless. So what does it do? It runs... No, I definitely add these modules.
These two definitely exist. WPA Supplicant and WPA CLI. It definitely copies the config because I've seen all three of those in etc folder. Yep. So A enable wireless. Which is here. I've definitely seen this. Waiting for connection for max 30 seconds, which it does. What if I run this script manually? Uh, here, it never reaches the the line that says killing on the sys uh, so the system takes over later. That never shows up. So it never reaches that point because it's still on the pre-mount stage because it never mounts. Does it copy these scripts to? I just ran the script manually. And this is the exact same stuff I see during normal boot. an IP. Yep, it's now connected. Because wh why do it manually if I have a script to do it? Oh. Confirm what the command for this is. NFS root discless. Wait, why am I mounting the mount point of the child to mount?
Uh, so the error it gives me is that it doesn't exist in FS tab. I can't use. Yeah, I, I, I made slash mount. Nope, no prompt. Currently just stuck here. <laughs> Control C doesn't do anything. I will have to restart. Yep. But here's the thing. It happily did stuff.
connect them to the Wi-Fi now. Wi-Fi connected. Okay, that worked. So NFS root slash diskless to slash mount and this and then I hit enter and those are my files. That's definitely a file that's on <laughs> in the diskless folder. So now what? Now do we just exit and see what happens? the disconnect script. The kill wireless one. Nothing. So, should I, uh, should I exit and see what happens? Now that we have a general idea of what we need to run to get to this stage. Exiting.
Okay, you might be right. I don't need to... I do need to rebuild it from here. Um... Oh, I'm in the wrong folder entirely. I wonder if I could get something in the UI to t uh, in Ubuntu to tell me which version of the kernel I'm running. Like, say, next to the clock. So that I know that when I delete the 5.3 kernel, I know I'm not going to cause any issues. <laughs> didn't remove it. It was a right protector. Thought I did. Mm -hmm. It's a job in itself. 
your alternative is have another PC that's on Wi-Fi, and then bridge it with the Ethernet adapter on that PC. Share the network connection. So we are currently at 106 megabytes. Oh, it'll be messy. The way I did it was I ran it under the house. But I know that's not an option for everyone. Oh yeah. That could work. No, it's one meg larger. <laughs> Put it straight into Windows, I think. Yeah, it did. Yes, but how do you know what to remove? <laughs> and this is without working Ethernet firmware. Because we haven't actually added the script to copy that. So, you know. I mean... To be honest, my surface is actually loading these 100 meg images pretty quick. So I'm not too worried. Here we go. That's weird. If I don't break pre-mount, then the hardware device doesn't exist yet. Yeah, never got an IP. No, I removed the break. <laughs> That's alright, I'm gonna reboot this. Add the break pre-mount and then try again. Like, I don't know if there's a wait signal I can add that listens until the network adapter appears.
So here's what I'm going to do as a test. I'm going to manually connect the network. It did run the pre-mount script. But it ran it directly before the Wi-Fi adapter showed up as a device. And it said it successfully enabled the device. Even though, even though it then got confused. Alright, so now we have an IP, because I've done this manually, and now I'm going to hit exit. Mm, same error. I can't think of a reason why this would fail. The firmware crashed. Oh, that's not the screen that I needed to be on. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Not properly. Because I did, and then I forgot to actually copy... Yep. <laughs> Just delayed. Just waiting for Windows to boot. Because I didn't hold the button in time. I don't have, like, a comfortable spot where I can just... ...either prop it up or hold it. Also, why didn't this rotate? You're supposed to rotate.
I realized that if I do this uh, portrait, I can actually zoom in better. Yeah, so notice, here, it actually, BusyBox loaded, and then it found the Wi-Fi adapter. So I don't know whether I just need a delay pre-mount, like just put a wait in there and see what happens for the automatic one. No, same error. I might give up on this today here. I don't know what else I can do. There's the driver dump. I wonder if the Wi-Fi adapter hangs after an it. What I might do is I'll... Here's an action item for, my, for me. I'll learn the order in which these scripts run. Uh, get each of them to echo the network status and the list of known mounts. And that way, like I'll echo stage blank, Wi-Fi up, and we'll just do it the old-fashioned way. Either that, or is there a... The alternative is that... Does break support all of the stages? Like, can I put break equals pre-mount, init bottom, and so on and so forth with commas or something? So that I can then watch as each stage occurs and tell it, hey patiently wait for this next bit. I think we made progress, though. We got drivers working. We got it to connect to the Wi-Fi network. It's just the NFS mount that it gets stuck on. And the other thing I have to test... Top, modules, pre-mount, mount, mount root, bottom, init. Which starts a debug shell. You can try, for example, break pre-mount. You can add this to the kernel line, or you can do it interactively. Now you're in the debug shell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just don't know if I can tell it to break at each of them so that I just manually hit exit five times and see what happens in between each stage. Or if I'm stuck just... <laughs> 
modifying the grub menu each time to add each of the individual breaks. Or if I can set the environment variable to the next break, then hit exit. Anyway, that's going to be it from me. Um, thanks for watching. Thanks for the help, walking dude. I'll see you guys next time.